Hello, I think we're live. So hi guys, my name is Fiona Lamptey and welcome to the craft of casting for comedy and drama, um, part of the BAFTA television, the sessions supported by TCL, a virtual series to celebrate some of the nominees and nominated programmes from this year's Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards and the British Academy Television Craft Awards. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping, which I'm going to read out, sorry, forgive me. Um, so these virtual sessions are part of BAFTA's learning work to share expertise from TV, film and games with audiences far and wide. Um, so you can check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA socials channels for more activity and news. Uh, we're streaming this of this event on Zoom and YouTube and recording the conversation to share further. Um, join the conversation um, on social using the hashtag BAFTA TV sessions. Um, you can ask questions um, in the at below at the below of your Zoom function, um, which we will address later. Um, closed captioning is available, which you can turn on using the CC button below. And finally, um, I'm just going to welcome um, our speakers. So they're all wave. So Laura Evans. Hi. Hi Laura. <laughs> um, Des Hamilton. Hi, Des. Oh. Nina Gold. Hello. Hey. Um, Robert Stern. Hello. Hey, Robert. Yoko, Yoko Narahashi. Hello. Hi, Yoko. Shaheen Baig. Hi. Hi, Shaheen. And Layla Merrick Wolf. Hi. Hi all, and, and congratulations on your nomination. Um, so just to kick start, um, this is the first time that casting has been included um, as an awards category, which is weird. Um, <laughs> um, so tell me, have you guys got any kind of initial thoughts about that? Someone has to start. I'm going to start picking picking on people. Shaheen, I know you. Oh, Go on, no. Shaheen. It's like, it's like celebrity squares or something. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, wow, we're you know we're a head of department, um, mm -hmm. so it's wonderful that it has <clears throat> finally been recognised. I mean, um, casting is a huge contribution to a project, um, and I think that. Uh, like costume editing cinematography um it's it, it should be uh, recognized and also i think because then people know that it's a viable industry career to to go into because otherwise casting sort of we continue the myth that it's a mysterious sort of secret job and actually by it uh, it being you know having a category of afters it suddenly becomes much more visible to people yeah and that visibility is so important. Anyone else got anything else to add? We all agree. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know, as you guys said, you're the head of the department and a lot of the creative discussions start with casting. Um, can you tell me at what point you got involved in your, your respective projects um, and what, you know, what made you say yes? What, what drew you to them? Who wants to go? Shall I go? Yeah. yeah. Go on then. Go on, <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> uh, I came on board when the project was already greenlit by Netflix. And um, just, just think your, your project is sex, sex education. education. That's mm -hmm. it. So we were already fully greenlit. And I um, had my initial meeting with Jamie Campbell, the exec producer and the director, Ben Taylor, who invited me in to basically pitch on the project. Um, and uh, they told me their vision um, and what they were hoping to achieve. Um, and we sort of took it from there. And it was a mixture of um, it being a Netflix show, which was hugely appealing. The scripts were brilliant. And I was a massive fan of Ben's from Catastrophe and Eleven Film. So, um, yeah, it was a no-brainer. What about you, Nina? Um, we... So we'd worked with Karen Strauss, one of the producers of Chernobyl, for a lot, you know, over 10 years on Game of Thrones and other things. 
and we'd worked with HBO a lot. And then Carolyn sent us, Carolyn introduced us to Jane Featherstone, the other producer. And we read this brilliant script by Craig Mazin that was just mind-blowingly amazing. And then we went and met him. We happened, to, Robert and I happened to be in LA and we met him with Carolyn and just started doing it. And, and then, then I think, was that before Johan? Maybe Johan Renk was, has, or was already there. We met him, you know, shortly after that. And, and then we just all launched into this, you know, enormous ensemble casting that went on for a long time. Cool. And Des, your, yours is slightly different because you, obviously you've had uh, a relationship with the producers on Top Boy. Um, what made you, what makes you come back? What, you know, how do you breathe fresh life into it? How do you, you know, read the script and think this is what I can do something new? Uh, I really like the world of it, the environment. And it's, uh, for me and my colleagues, it's an opportunity to find uh, new people and bring them on. And uh, I was excited as well to work with the four different directors. I was aware of them. And that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I love, uh, as Nina was saying there, I love uh, our writer. Ronan Bennett. I'm a big fan of all his writing, so it's always a kind of joy to be involved with anything that he's doing. Brilliant. Yeah. Yoko, do you, mm -hmm. you want to add um, what, what, what well, attracts you to a project, kind of way, where you started off with Giri Hadi? Well, um, of course, the story mm -hmm. um, was amazing. Just the title is Japanese, which was kind <laughs> very surprising uh, for a BBC Netflix. And, uh, and then I read it and I really loved um, Joe Barton's work. And, um, and having met Chris um, and Jane Featherston too, um, of Sister Productions, they're just they're wonderful people and just got very excited with um, the content. And uh, having met uh, Julian, the director, and also Joe, um, it was just, they're just so wonderful. So it was a, a, a real pleasure to, to be able to participate in this. this I just really loved the writing um, when I first started. And Leila, I know you, Shaheen, and Yoko worked together in the casting, but can you talk a bit about kind of how, how that happens? Like how, you know, you, you work on different how does it all work when there's more than one casting? Um, well, we're really lucky in Jean's office anyway because she's very collaborative and she involves everybody in the office. But um, I think on a project like this, we're just, yeah, sharing everything and um, making sure constantly kind of talking to make sure we're on the same page. Um, and yeah, no, it's it was amazing when we got the... Um, the script through we already had a relationship with Julian but like Yoko said when we saw the script we were just like it has it has to happen because it's so brilliant um so we had a chat about it and then yeah made a kind of decision on that together. Shaheen how do you make sure that you're kind of all your visions are aligned when it comes to casting when you're working with different people? Um, well with this with Giri Hashi Yoko actually came on first because um Jack get booked up way 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 in advance and so the Japanese casting had to start quite a way in advance I think Yoko it's quite a sort of long time before um so the, that had already sort of started and then I'd worked with Julian before and so we sort of came on um and so we were watching Yoko's work we were watching all the tapes come in from Japan and so constantly sort of having conversations with uh, Julian and Jane and Chris and Joe about uh, how we could sort of connect the two elements of casting but we were sort of you know we were given an amazing head start with the work that Yoko was doing and and then it just it sort of it felt quite natural um, with the work with the work that sort of followed from here but we just um, you know there was a very kind of Julian was I suppose the sort of connecting mm. element between us and Yoko very much so um, and also we were on 
completely opposite time zones. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that was tricky. Yeah. Robert, last but not least. So tell me about kind of your experience and when you got involved and what attracted you to the project. Oh, well, it's the same as Nina. We just got these kind of incredible scripts through. Um, and I, I mean, I, I remember being very small when that whole Chernobyl incident happened. And I didn't really know anything about it. And then we read these amazing scripts that were amazingly researched. Uh, and went and had this meeting with this writer and just, it was totally fascinating. He was kind of, he'd done years of research on the project. So he know, he, he just kind of knew everything there was to know on that mm. subject. And we just sat and chatted about it. And then started talking about, you know, tones of actors, the kind of flavours that you wanted to get in there. And we just started a conversation and then, you know, got going. I mean, the whole thing with Chernobyl that I remember that was quite you, 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 exciting about Chernobyl, that it was really collaborative, like all the way through the whole process. We had, you know, the director, the writer, all the producers in the room at the actual castings. So every decision that was made and everybody kind of finding our way into how we wanted to cast these parts could all be discussed together as a team, which was, you know, great and unusual. Yeah, but I suppose if you're all aligned with the creative, I mean, that's why it's so important to have those discussions up front is because that alignment is essential so that you can all be in the room and agree or disagree. Um, so my next question is about kind of the, the, B, the B word, budget. <laughs> Can everyone hear that? I've got a strange fuzzing sound. Anyway, let's mm -hmm. continue. Um, so how does, you know, the, the budget level, the size of the film, the scope of the film change the way in which you cast a project? Should I pick? <laughs> uh, Des. Thanks. <laughs> uh, um... In terms of, uh, from my own experience, just the uh, access you have to higher profile talent that, uh, you know, are obviously that bit more expensive. So if the budget's quite minimal, which I prefer in many ways, as a casting person, you've got more freedom to read people. You have people come I won't be sending out direct offers, which I particularly dislike. You get to meet people, they get to come in, and then they go through a process of being recalled and they connect with the director. And in my opinion, it makes for it makes for more interesting, possibly better casting. You know, so it's. Um, it is what it is, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get a script that you like and producers ask you to work on it with them, you know, like um, the budget thing's just one of many obstacles. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's, you know, that's kind of the job. You know, something pops up and you navigate your way around it. Yeah. yeah. Lady, you, you smiled when... Um, um, Des said about the budget being one of many obstacles. What what does it present for you, the budget and the scope? Um, I guess, ooh, yeah, I guess when you have a smaller budget, it's kind of an opportunity to be creative and have the kind of freedom um, to, you, you know, you can kind of just look for uh, new talent, which obviously is something that we're always striving to do um, with kind of the pressure relieved a little bit. But um, yeah, the, the, you get problems with smaller budgets and then you get other pressures and problems from larger budgets. So it's kind of smudge for muchness sometimes, as long as you're kind of confident the work you're doing is, mm. you know, if you believe in it, then you kind of hope other people will believe in it and, and want to do it. Um, regardless of it's, it's walking that line, I guess, between mm. being as fair as you can and also hoping like some people just gonna want to do it to be involved as well. Um, if you've really got a, a minuscule budget. <laughs> Mm. Is this a, what, does the same apply for you, Robert? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been, it's, yeah, I mean, it's another, <laughs> just got to go and you know, get out there and get creative with it. 
with and, yeah with, I, um, I, with the Japanese actors it was you know we all loved this whole idea of Japan and um, London you know this very international um, collaborative um, story and uh, this is one of the wonderful things about it and um, so I think when I talk to actors, you know, whether they're very famous and well established to, you know, ones who are, are still fresh and new, um, it, I think really, I didn't have a problem really with the budget um, because I think they all really wanted to participate, you know, whether they're, I mean, they're well known and it, it didn't matter, you know, it, it's, uh, not, it wasn't about the money. It was about really, you know, participating in this uh, project. And that's what I thought was, it, 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 it exemplifies, I think, the spirit of, of this project, you know. It was a really international, wonderful collaboration, I think. So for me, I didn't have a lot of trouble. <laughs> with budget. Does anyone well, else have that? Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think that sometimes, you know, I often work on films with £2.50 budget. And actually, if the script is amazing, you know, if the team is brilliant, then, um, you know, of course, there's always going to be some talent that is sort of out of reach, you know. But but if the if the script is kind of brilliant enough, then, um, you know, actors will always want to see that. They'll always want to see those scripts. So it, it shouldn't stop you from trying to get a higher level talent. Thank you. Um and let's talk about ensemble cast because the, I suppose the, the, the thing that a lot of people think about is like, where do you start? What, where's the starting point? Well, it's <laughs> normally the leads. <laughs> you normally, I mean, with, with most ensembles, you kind of put the kind of, cut. there's always a couple of key players, I think, mm. you know, um, and then you sort of, then that will sort of start to set the tone um for the ensemble but normally that uh, you start with the, with the with there's always a couple of lead parts that you start with and do you do you find um when you're talking to execs and showrunners there's like are you usually on the same page at the beginning or does it take quite a lot of convincing like what are kind of, what are the, some of the conversations you're having at that stage when you start casting I think the initial approach and the vision of the team and what it is that you're hoping to achieve or whether you want to make it hugely you know, representative or you want everyone to have their sort of distinct personalities. And I think it's as you get into it and you start to pull your selects and present them to the team that the questions start and then the conversations start about how you move on. And because of course it's so subjective and everyone has a different opinion on it. And then it's about trying to align our thoughts as we get further into the process, which becomes difficult, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it will be all good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I've got a question here, um, unless someone's got something else to add. Um, does casting for an ensemble allow you to be more creative or work differently as casting more roles? and the craft that goes into making the company of actors work together. I think the, the, the whole thing of putting ensembles together is always really interesting because you're putting a jigsaw together, but it's a kind of very dynamic jigsaw. And it's not just about plonking people in parts. It's about thinking, what happens if I put that, per, you know, if, 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 if we put that per, those two people together, what does that create? You know, are you setting people up to kind of mirror each other, to contrast each other? Um, it's what people create between them, which mm. is interesting about it, rather than, you know, putting people in individual parts. It's like dynamics between people. If you think of something like, you know, normal people, say the two leads are really so excellent on their own, but the magic, the real magic is what happens between the two of them you know, what they create between them, there's, that's where the kind of magic lies. And I think it's the same with ensemble casting as well. It's you know, the dynamic between people. You're all nodding, sorry. Um, so <laughs> now like the hot topic, of course, is diversity at the moment. 
Um, what steps do you guys take to ensure that you are representing a diverse and inclusive cast? I'm picking uh, Nina. <laughs> um, I think you we we all we would we all agree that you'd be insane and wrong and you know, living in the dark ages, if you were not trying to make it an inclusive and diverse cast. And so I think we just, you know, when you, you're not sort of saying, okay, here's a list of persons of color and here's a list of white people for this part. You're making a list of great actors for a particular part that includes all sorts of people and you're making sure that you you're not I mean I, I and so that you're looking at it as a whole and that the pool of actors as a whole and then approaching it like that and but obviously making sure that you're that all different sorts of people are being considered and given a fair chance to you know get the part mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've made a sort of concerted effort to also building our own databases of actors from underrepresented groups. So rather than waiting for them to be suggested to us, we sort of make that effort to, to search them out and make sure that they're given an opportunity to apply or to find out about a project if they're not you know, suggested by an agent if they're not represented, um, you know, actors from the trans or non-binary community or disabled artists and just ensuring that everyone is aware of what's going on and that they're, they're visible to us and they're given the opportunity to come in for a part. So I think that's definitely a, a, a big sort of, um, it's something that we're trying to push forward with and expand on as we go through our different projects. And it's our, you know, it's our job to make sure that, 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 that who, you know, the actors we're presenting to the directors, to the producers are as representative as possible. And if that is, if that's not fully existing in the system, we have to look outside of the system and we have to, you know, a lot of our job is research. It's, con you know, it's looking in all kinds of different places um, and also to try and encourage people to come into the industry. So there is you know a full representation and so it's you know whenever we approach anything it's sort of you know we have to uh make sure that we are presenting um a real variety of, of actors to the to the director and the producer because otherwise we're not doing our job properly mm -hmm. and i suppose the sweet spot is when people start considering actors that they wouldn't necessarily have considered um so yeah that's very important um, and this is a question that's come in. So is blind casting something any of you guys explore? Currently would like to explore? Blind casting. Yeah. <laughs> blind casting. Colour blind casting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All of us, yeah. I would imagine all of us always did that. You know, you're looking for the best actor for the role. That's mm. always been in play. Ultimately, projects I work on, I don't make the decision against the part. But I try and present as many great options as possible to the director and the production. And, you know, when we're bringing people on to read, of course, it's totally blind. You know, you're not... I don't think it's not something. It's not a new concept for you. No, it's, for, it's something. For, yeah. for us, it's been the way. It's, it's always been that way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I am. I am trying to find the most interesting, impactful person for that part. Um, mm. Nothing else comes into it. No. And very rarely now, I think, is um, or sh you know, is ethnicity detailed in a script. It, it, there's no need for it unless it's you know we're talking about a real person you know yeah. but otherwise um 
it's it's becoming it's becoming rarer that actually that you find that in a script and I think it's also our job to to challenge that yeah and I think that's true like the more scripts I read there's less you know that description is not there but I think what still exists and something that you guys are definitely a part of and will continue to be a part of is that it's implied either in the way the character's written or, you know, in the back of our head, we know who this person is. And I suppose with you guys offering up more options, that's the, the best way to start to kind of making people consider different options to what they imagined. Um, so if it's okay with you guys, we'll move on to kind of the, the detail of each of your respective projects. With Chernobyl being such a significant moment in modern history um, for Robert and Nina, how, how much did you do to research? Um, I know you said the writers did a lot of research themselves, but how much did you guys do? And how do you maintain the authenticity, how did you maintain the authenticity um, of that history? You go, Nina. <laughs> well, I mean, he, Craig, amazing, the writer, was the most, non I, I get the feeling he knows more about Chernobyl and the surrounding times than anybody else in the world. He had done, his detail in the research was so incredible. And so, and he, they created this kind of massive online database thing of all the reading and all the facts and all the photos and all you know just covering it in incredible detail so we really delved into that we read this incredible book called Chernobyl Prayer which is a um, kind of various people's verbatim accounts of what happened which is a, just an amazing book and a lot of those stories are in the script and yeah, we got pretty into the detail of the research, but um, and then the authentic. I mean, there was the whole big thing was obviously it's a Soviet world, and we were casting it with English act, well, English and other European actors mainly, and so there was a lot, a lot, a lot of conversation about what we would do with act as an overview and a whole, what would happen with the accents. And eventually, I think we all, well, we all agreed, and I think everybody watching it agreed in the end, apart from one review, <laughs> that a kind of people trying to do a kind of fake Russian, Ukrainian accent would ultimately take you out of the story. Mm. And, but that was a big topic of debate for a long time. And that we were trying to aim for a kind of nondescript English accent, which of course is sort of impossible, but that was what we were trying to do to get it into a kind of not too regional, not too class orientated, generalized English accent. And to try, I mean, you know, it's, to, we would we the, the hours we spent talking about whether these you know each act various actors had a kind of Eastern European feel even though they were English they were mm -hmm. obsessing about whether people had the sort of Eastern European head shape <laughs> or <laughs> general feel and we were obsessed with it and that's what we tried to make uh, make it not feel too just English. Mm -hmm. Eastern European head shape, that's an interesting oh, way to go. You can't go. think about it, you can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to watch it again and just look at everyone's head shape. Um, and Robert, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that the fact that there was loads of information about, you know, the specific people there at that time, who they were and what their lives were, was just really interesting and inspiring. I don't know, it somehow kind of raised the stakes for the actors who were doing it because they wanted to kind of honor these people in a, you know, appropriately. And it gave them lots to play with when they were kind of dealing with the scripts. And I suppose in terms of authenticity, I mean, I mean, we were creating our own and we were creating our own thing. Mm. Uh, just had to make sure that everybody kind of conformed to it and felt real within that and didn't distract from that. We had to kind of create a very particular tone that, 
you know, we felt was believable as people in Euro Ukraine in the 1980s. And, you know, thinking of actors in terms of not having the ticks of the kind of British class system um, and putting that thing together and how that worked. So, yeah. And oh, sorry, to, uh, maybe I mean just sort of your Eastern European vibe or look. <laughs> but, um, I the other thing, yeah, because once you're not, you know, it's not a naturalistic, authentic world. As soon as everybody isn't speaking in Russian and actually being Russian, so we've tried to create our own version of of an authentic world, which you know, which once you buy into it, is believable as its own whole, with its own integrity. Mm -hmm. And as you, you're, you know, created the next top drop boy generation, what was it about uh, Michael Wards that you saw that you just knew? Like, did you know straight away? Talk, talk us through that process. He actually came in for as very often happens in auditions, he came in for the role of the younger brother and uh, he had that kind of uh, magic about him and he had a wonderful energy and we all really warmed him so we asked him to come back for that, the lead role of Jamie and uh, he just, he, he, he was, uh, he just seemed up to him where he was in his own personal life, he was ready to do something. He, he was totally up for it. He was obsessed with Top Boy as well in the world and his read was phenomenal. You know, he was, his preparation was superb and his execution, we thought, the directors and producers in the room, it was, you know, it was very, energizing you know it was a wonderful moment we could see him you know immersing into the role before us it was a lovely experience he's a wonderful yeah. actor. so exciting yeah. um and then lauren so sex education for me feels like so new so fresh does that give you and um, the feeling did you feel at the time that you were creating something new and does that give you freedom or, you know, what kind of pressure is attached to the newness of something? Mm, it is, it's, um, it's really great to have that flexibility to, to look for new people and not feel the pressures of having someone who's recognisable or someone who needs to satisfy, you know, financiers. But also when they're asking for eight newcomers to play leading roles who are going to be option, you're like, where do I find them? And how do you uncover them? And how do you make them all feel very different, but work together and have that chemistry because we're also a relationship show. Um, so everything has to fit together. But um, I mean, it was a total joy. It was just about seeing a lot of people and trusting my sort of instincts and tastes, which I never knew I really had or felt comfortable with until I started doing it and putting forward the people I really liked. And mm -hmm. it was just brilliant to have that freedom to actually meet a lot of people and sort of keep them in mind if they weren't right for that particular part, that there might be something else for them in the show somewhere. But yeah, the pressures to find someone who satisfied the age, the character, who was comfortable with the sexual content and all that was, yeah, tricky, but just a total dream. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and then Yoko, Shaheen and Leila. Um, so we talked a bit about ensemble cast and the collaboration briefly between you guys. Um, Yoko, can you talk a bit about kind of making um, the Japanese, you know, how you approach, how, do, how you approach casting? Because um, it was unknown Japanese actors, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and making sure they feel just as compelling as the British actors. Mm. Well, um, at the very beginning, we didn't know who the, um, you know, the, the British uh, actors were, were or would be. Mm -hmm. But um, um, what I thought was very important is, for example, um, if you're Japanese, you would be able to differentiate all the various types of people. 
But let's say, you know, from your side and you see, you know, a bunch of um, black haired <laughs> Asian people, it's harder to distinguish, I think. So I thought it was very important that I really, um, you know, that every person, whether even if it's a small role, um, is, is striking in their own, um, you know, role. Um, in other words, that you don't, you know, you don't forget them, that, that they, there's something, you know, um, particular, specific about them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really trying to uh, differentiate each person in each role. And, but I, I think for me also it was really the quality of acting that would, um, you know, cross the international, um, you know, uh, it, it's not just for Japan. I think if it's just for Japan or Japanese television, there would be a certain <clears throat> acting, especially, for example, like Yakuza, you know, um, that's like a, a brand, you know, and people act a certain way if, if you become Yakuza. But I wanted a real, uh, uh, you know, a, a really good actor who can really, you know, um, get into the soul of, of what an actor, what this role could be, and he have, would happen to be a Yakuza, you know. Um, so that was my particular, um, I think, effort in trying to make sure that uh, whoever Julian saw or, or Joe or Chris or Jane, that that um, they could, spec you know, they can see the differences. They can tell right away, that, you know, who each person was. And I think that's that was, I yeah, I made effort to make sure that they were very specific and, you know, for all the roles. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can relate to that person because I think when you're casting, especially something that is culturally quite important to you, it's, you know, it's the details that count. Mm. It's the small things that, you know, potentially a global audience won't pick up. That's really important to the home audience. Um, so Shaheen, I'm just going to ask you about kind of, I know this is a key component to all you know, the things that you cast, but that authenticity and what that means for you in casting. Well, it was, it was just picking up on a little bit on what Yoko said about soulful. I think mm. that the thing that really attracted me to the project is that I felt the characters were very soulful. And so when we were trying to find the cast in, in the UK, we wanted to match that tone, but also we wanted to make London, we wanted to see London as it is. So we wanted it to, you know, we wanted it to feel, you know, the diversity of London and uh, the energy of London. We really mm -hmm. wanted that to come across um, with with the London cast. And even again, we you know tiny, you know, lips of one, you know, day, someone that's coming in for a day or, you know, might pop up in one episode and not until kind of four episodes later. It was just really important that they were all, because of the, because of the style of the show was so vivid and we were mi in a mix in animation um, and also just Dance, the two different, yeah. the start, yeah, it was so vivid. And so it was just really important that all the car all the actors had, um, were sort of, that were as sort of, could, could, not that they could, you know, not they weren't competing with it. That they were as sort of memorable um, as as the tone of the show. Um, and so, you know, if you're if you're telling a story set in London, you want it. I want it to feel as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and and Julian's, uh, you know, Julian Ben, a very instinctive director, and we cast quite instinctively. So it was just, you know, we saw a lot of people, but. Um, it was really fun. It was really <laughs> fun casting because, um, you know, we saw lots of people, you know, never seen before, lots of new people um, and just, you know, finding, and also, you know, I think we saw nearly all the Japanese <laughs> actors in, <laughs> in the UK, um, of which there's still, you know, quite a small pool, uh, which was fantastic. So lot, we saw lots and lots of kind of new talent that we hadn't had the opportunity necessarily to meet before. Mm -hmm. the, the tone of the of this one in particular was quite interesting in regards to authenticity because there was such a like amazing blend of realism but kind of mythology as well <laughs> um there was something kind of otherworldly about it but then um very naturalistic as well so I just I, I think there, were the, there was a lot of conversation about actors that had that kind of vividness um just trying to mix lots of 
maybe contradictory, like contradictory aspects of it. Like there's some mythology, some realism, there's um, new faces and faces that we're, that we are more familiar with and just trying to kind of keep the balance of all those things going because that they seem to be doing a lot of that in the script and we wanted to kind of reflect that and like Shaheen said the tone that was kind of set from those initial Japanese tapes that were coming through were just yeah it was super exciting so we just wanted to kind of we had the responsibility of kind of matching up to that and keeping it so <laughs> memorable and vivid. Um, I, I can just want to say one thing is I, I love the uh, humour yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Of the British actors, I just I, I just love that. That's a cultural <laughs> thing. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um. So, and this is my need for gossip because you know I like to hear the real stories that happen behind the scenes. But you know, obviously you're working with execs that potentially you know have different tastes, opinions to you guys. What are the things that you either on these projects or generally have to push for um, that, you know, execs aren't initially convinced about? What are the conversations that you're having? Without naming names. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> silence. I think it will always be like this. <laughs> There's someone maybe that you initially, you know, see and you think oh that's exactly what I see in my mind and what they've done is just exactly what I read on the page and you maybe spend a lot of time with them and bring them into a recall and put lots of effort and you know other creators just aren't seeing it and I think sometimes that's really difficult because then you have to adjust your thinking and it's hugely collaborative and like Dare said earlier it's not our job to tell them who to cast it's trying to mm. steer them away from who not to cast but yeah sometimes <laughs> that's um that's tricky to yeah a bit of pill to swallow when you think that that person is it but no one else sees it and yeah, often it can happen mm. you can see somebody quite early on in the in the casting process and it's just natural you <laughs> want to keep going you want to keep going see more people and then off and then you can often go back to the beginning you know sometimes of you know it's happened a number of times when guilty maybe the first or second <laughs> person, you know you you've met and actually six months later you go back to that person um but also the the joy is that <clears throat> sometimes you imagined a role and an actor comes in and completely turns it on its head mm. and i think it's wonderful when everyone's really open to that mm -hmm. you know all the execs and director you know that we're that we're all open to that process because sometimes that is for it's a brilliant thing for the project and i just want to talk a little bit about um and this is aimed at des and um you know how do how do you create you you do a lot of street casting um a lot of the cast you know haven't been in a casting environment before how do you make that a comfortable environment for them to do their best work you know how does that happen they, what things do you put in place I swear <laughs> I, I didn't even hear you that was so quick I swear <laughs> you swear at them yeah and I tell them daft stories about whatever is going on in my fucked up personal life and then they realise they're not uh, they kind of relax into the that it's not a rigid, the word casting and the word audition brings about a certain amount of fear. Mm. You know, it's so unknown to people. And, you know, for me, I, I went to auditions, you know, and, uh, when I was young and I thought, you know, I'd get the part if I wore a stark shirt and my hair was gone correctly. And, you know, I was a terrible, terrible actor. Nina can, Nina has <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, watch me for the finger. So I, I can now. Uh, that's that's what I do with non-actors. I try and it's only just come up in conversation a lot recently. I, I uh, try and make them forget they're at an audition. That it's a safe place. You know, I, I'm from that environment very often of a lot of the. Uh, projects that I work on. I'm from a similar environment. So 
if the strips became too prescriptive for them, we'll try and get rid of it and improvise it. And the thing I'm often, we're often repeating is say what you would say, forget about the script, do what you would do with mm. the reason. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does. I think so. <laughs> Basically, I think you're saying that you are normal and you, you, you normalise that environment. You get an argument from my peers. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to find I'm improving on a daily basis, I like to think. Yeah, the worst normality. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> But I think, you know, they're, they're, as you said, it is, it's a mystery what happens in that room. And I think the more you make it, uh, it's not an audition, it's for you to express yourself. And sometimes that might work in your favour and sometimes it won't. But, you know, yeah, just so take the fear out of it. It's to be enjoyed. You know, the worst thing that could ever happen, and I'm sincere here, is that somebody leaves our office feeling bad about themselves. Mm. You know, all of us are just trying our best. And I'm very aware that it is very difficult for people, actors as well, it's a difficult process. You know, a lot of actors don't like auditioning, they struggle with it. So you do what you can on a human level to try and make it a pleasant experience. And we want, you know, it's such a, there's such a huge amount of trust you know, for an actor to come into an audition room, you know, we want them to have a, you know, to, to leave that room, as Des says, feeling like they did the, you know, they had a good meeting. And um, and so we, you know, we want the actors to come in and enjoy it and it to be a collaborative process. Um, because, you know, of course, only one person can get the role, but, mm. you know, we hope that it's the start of a, if it's somebody new, we hope that it's the start of a, of a relationship, you know, and we'll work with them in the future. Or they've just, if it's a if it's a young person and they've never done it before, that they've had a good time, regardless of what happens. They've had a good time. They've got off school for a couple of hours. They've met some new people and they've learned something new. We've learned something new. And then they, you know, they go back to the, you know, to, to, to their everyday life. I think just as long as it's a it's a positive experience and we make that space as safe as it can be and as open and a collaborative as it can be Ooh. okay so guys thank you so much i'm going to go to some questions that people submitted um so one of the questions how do you think i'm talking to you how do you guys feel about self tapes well they're very in fashion at the moment <laughs> <laughs> we've got to love them yeah. <laughs> Pandemic aside, like how did you feel about them before the world started going crazy? I mean, sound tapes can be amazing, but it's not it do, it's not the same as working with someone in the room. Um, but it's a brilliant thing to open up, you know, you can see people, you know, from the other end of the country, from the other side of the world, and that's an amazing thing. It's opened up casting massively in that way, but the, you know the, the 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 joy is being in the room and and working with an actor um i can't see you guys because i've got the questions up and i i'm turning to my mom i don't know how to move them oh i've moved them um <laughs> oh no I, I definitely can't see you one of the questions <laughs> is um what do you guys do with the self tapes afterwards <laughs> Not in a not in a very weird not in a weird way, but um, <laughs> stop. <laughs> um, but is is it is it something that you keep, and then when you think of that person for another role, do you share it? Can you share it? What happens? No, I've, I've never shared a self tape for one project with another project. I don't know if that would be. Fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I think. But they are quite good for, for you, just for you, if you're, you know, even if you can't, you can't really send a tape with some, a, you know, a different project's material to a, to another, to a third party, but you can look back at it and think, 
yeah, let's get him to have a go at this other thing. Mm. Yeah. Um, someone's asked, um, if you receive an email from an actor with a CV, how likely are you to file their CV? Um, look at the, you know, the tapes that they've sent you. Um, what do you look for in cold emails? Do you read them? Personally, it's, it's very hit and miss. You know, you have, like anybody else, in any form of employment, you have exceptionally busy days where you're focused on the job at hand. But uh, it's not, for, speaking for myself, it's not totally useless. Sometimes you read one and, and you want to be a, you know, it's just personal to me. I think I want to be a better person. I want to respond. I want to, you know, I'll have a look at it and maybe progress it. But uh, but that is definitely not the majority. Vast thing of these, you know, cold emails. But I wouldn't say it's utterly redundant. It's also about lucky timing, isn't it? If you know, yeah. emails you when you're up to here with something else and you can't think about, you know, you're just really, really busy with something else then it kind of probably just you know passes you by but if it somebody emails you at a good moment and it just happens to be in a moment when that you know sometimes it it's just all about lucky timing really and there's never enough hours in the day to respond you know to all the emails but I think if someone, you know, has been really honest and open in their email, you know, we'll always we try even if it's like a couple of weeks later to, to reply, even if it's just to say, we've seen it, we've got it, acknowledge it, but it's hard, you know, because we're, you know, you, you, we, the day is full um, and we can never see or reply to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question um, that I'm gonna read out. It's quite a long one, but I think it's really important. So um, it says, as an actor, member of Spotlight, but without an agent, with disabilities. What is your approach to contacting finding disabled actors? Um, and then goes on to say, making reasonable adjustments for disabled actors for the casting process and promoting disabled actors. Um, this Pythons find it quite hard um, being invited and supported onto projects. Um, what help and advice can you offer? So that they don't get forgotten about, forgotten about. You know it's important when everyone just like. I'm trying to. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I think yeah. it's really important. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think how, it's just something that we have a, a sort of duty of care that we are holding all of our castings in uh, disabled friendly. Um, studios so there's no accessibility issues and that if we have any actors who are hearing impaired that we're making provisions for that and again just making sure that we're finding alternative means of accessing um, these underrepresented actors mm. whether we look via social media using certain hashtags yeah. or seek out different um, um, organizations um, or different arts groups that deal with um, actors with disabilities and just make sure that we are doing our continued research to build this database and make sure that the opportunity is is there, basically. Yeah. It'd be quite good yeah. if someone can name, like, for visibility, where this person should be. So they mentioned Spotlight, but also the organisations you're talking about. Like, what hashtags would you be searching under to find them? It, it all depends. I mean, we found we had um, um, an, a disabled actor in series two of Sex Ed called George Robinson, who we initially found through Visible Artists, um, which is um, an actors agency. Um, so there's lots of arts organisations out there that access all arts and just various ones. Some are for, um, you know, I think we were looking at one point for um, actors with amputations. So there's certain ones for for that as well um all depends i don't even know what hashtags because they're very specific because we don't want to make sure that everyone is grouped under yeah. one yeah. label um but there's definitely 
yeah, there's lots of research sort of out there. There's lots of different arts groups um, to be found. Yeah, whenever we're posting, if we're posting a, um, something on social media, we'll make the, the, the hashtag specific to, the, to what, we're, what the role we're searching for. Right, but, okay. Uh, but we would always sort of, you know, there's theatre groups, there's, um, as Laura was saying, you know, there's arts groups, organisations. There are a couple of agencies, um, but we do, it is one, you know, we do have to sort of branch out and do and, and research outside the system if we're, you know, when we're casting, um, because the system is still not fully um, representative yet. Thank you. Um, and what skills um, should people who want to get into casting develop? Robert. <laughs> Just kind of watch a lot of stuff and kind of build up your kind of knowledge of actors. I think it's also really useful to, you know, find a way of looking at performances and being able to talk about them, like having a vocabulary to see what's going on there, you know, what's working and what might not be working and really being able to articulate that. So when you're having discussions about, you know, what works and what doesn't for particular briefs and characters, um, you know, you can do it. Um, yeah, I mean, just building up that knowledge, building up that yeah. knowledge. And how do you guys work with, you know, casting assistants? Like, is that something, is it open call? Do people send you their CV? Like, what, what kind of experience do you expect when you bring people on board to work with you? Yoko. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, usually uh, my, um, my assistant um, was actually one of my former students as, as a, uh, you know, as an actor. Um, so he kind of knows, you know, um, what I think is authentic or real or what I think is mm -hmm. important in acting. And, and he, he's, onto that too so i think we we tend to see you know similar um qualities uh in, in an actor and so that really helps but he's also very just good in the technical um you know he has still lots to learn but um you know because i'm i i'm just completely into the world of of the actor when i start you know and and i try to leave the technical stuff to other people Mm -hmm. What about you, Dad? Um, I think I've just been very fortunate, and I've came. I've met people that wanted to work in casting, and the timing was right. And you know, I, you know, we've gave it a try, and it's kind of worked out. You know, um, I think that we have a similar work ethic, energy-wise, and that we have same sensibility and a sense of decency towards uh, the, the talent, the actors coming in. And also I've always been looking at uh, very often, I find it difficult to talk about this stuff. I don't want to sound too worthy, but a lot of the stuff that I work, I've been very fortunate to work on, I'm really into. So I have a sense of responsibility to it. I don't, kind of look at it as a job. This is like my first real job in life. So, you know, I really love it. I, mm -hmm. I love casting, I love my job. I love the people I work with. There's good days, bad days, but it's, it's far better than I previously experienced. So yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Just when I um, came on as an assistant with Shaheen, I think, I didn't really have much, and like she mentioned earlier about how there's it's sort of mystified as a as a job. So I came onto it not really knowing a whole lot about what it even meant. I think a lot of people have this idea of a kind of X factor setup that you're in the audition room all the time and you're just sort of saying no to people. Um, <laughs> and it's it's not it's not quite like that at all. And so much of the work is actually well, I touched on it earlier that she works very collaboratively. So she's always encouraged it's about conversation just keeping on um, a conversation and education as an assistant you're 
trying to represent the person that you're working for so you have to get to know like I have to get to know Shaheen's taste but she's also at the same time encouraging you to develop your own taste and then marry those those two things so it's it's so much about keeping on talking keeping on educating yourself the industry and like your job is evolving all the time as well so you've kind of really got to keep on top of that so we all just try and it's you have to be very supportive <laughs> with one another it's a lot it's a lot to be mindful of all the time um so you yeah it's it's it works really well as a, as a job you might not think it would but it works well as a job as something you can kind of work together on um, I think I've got a question because I think Fiona's lost her connection. It says, um, have you ever casted then later thought, oops, maybe not? <laughs> no, <laughs> never. It's always been the right decision. <laughs> always. <laughs> I'm going really red, which says that that's not the case. But of course, I'm never safe. <laughs> There's like terrible weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. mm. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <All behind. laughs> um are there any oh, there's other like all these questions? Let's have a look. I'm not scared of questions. I'm just running this show. I know. Okay, Des, one for you, or sort of generally. With street casting, um, how do you maintain your relationship with actors who want to sustain their acting careers who haven't come from the traditional acting background? Uh, you know, you try and, you know, make suggestions, guide them along. Uh, if they want to progress, the best thing, the next step is to get representation from an agent and meet other casting directors, you know. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would suggest that they meet you guys, you know, I would tell them to get in touch and uh, if I could do anything, like I would try and phone you myself and ask if you would meet them. But obviously, you're trying to help them. Mm -hmm. the, the next step is to get an agent. And like we know, uh, all actors, regardless of experience, they, they get better and better the more auditions they go mm -hmm. to and can go along and then more relaxed and perform that bit better. So. There's a huge amount of nurturing, isn't there, that goes into if you cast someone who's, you know, first timer, it's, it's, you know, often, you know, they'll do the job and then, and then they sort of have to expect it to sort of go back to their regular life. And actually, you know, our, you know, our jobs continue, you know, we continue to nurture um, and help because, because, you know, essentially we're responsible for putting them into that production. And so therefore, um, we want to help them on the next part of that journey. And sometimes it is an acting again. Sometimes they just, you know, they've had a great experience and they don't want to do it again, but often they do. And it's sort of helping them, supporting them navigate their way through that, which, um, which is a responsibility we take really seriously. Mm -hmm. And how are we um, as casting directors widening our pools outside of drama schools and casting agencies, theatrical agencies? Where are we looking? I'm just, I don't know where I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking for all these. I'm very impressed that you're, you're all over this. Brilliant. <laughs> all depends on the brief, doesn't it? That we don't necessarily look to all the drama graduates all the time and the theatrical agencies, even though that's our maybe first port of call. But depending on the brief, whether you're looking for children or, you know, Lena and Rob with Game of Thrones, yeah. I'm mad you wouldn't be finding all those wonderful characters necessarily at the agencies and where would you then look? You're looking everywhere all the time at all the points, aren't you? And it depends mm -hmm. on what you're working on. You're suddenly on a job where it's lots of people from Liverpool and then you're suddenly thrown into that world and you have to run with it and be creative and looking for new ways to find new people rather than just, you know, putting a search on spotlight. I mean, that's the, the thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, I'm back. Lauren clocked the questions. So Thank you. I'm retiring now. <laughs> I, I think you should continue. I want to be a part I'm so yeah. sorry. This one's for you, Fiona. <laughs> I lost internet connection. Okay, I've got one. Um, 
Are you starting to see the cogs turning in the industry again? Do you think there will be an influx of work in the coming months? I mean, this is a good question. And have you got a crystal ball? There's a lot of things start, you know, there's a lot of push forward to things going again, though. Well, nothing's actually said yes. Well, nothing that I'm working on is actually 100% got a start date and definitely going to start. But there's a lot more positivity about how it's going to be possible and how, you know, I think people are putting their last bit details of how to, you know, how much more it's going to cost and exact how much longer it will take. And then I feel like in the next couple of weeks to a month things will start to really take shape unless of course there's a second wave in which case who knows what the hell is going to happen mm. it's all I mean there's definitely still some quite a lot of degree of uncertainty because the guy you know and also the guidelines are changing all the time so you could set them this week and then the situation could you know change worldwide again and then you have to revise the guidelines but it does feel like we're moving towards production again um but i think it will be sort of quite it feels like it will be kind of slow gradual and then hopefully fingers crossed the beginning of next year we'll then, go back to sort of normality that's what we hope then there'll be a massive bum fight for all the yeah. all the actors <laughs> all through all the studios everything <laughs> there'll be a massive punch up <laughs> um, so I've got a question here about um, mentorship. Um, do you mentor actors outside of casting them? I'm on a scheme with BAFTA Elevate where I'm one of the mentors and consultants and there's 21 actors from underrepresented groups. Um, so they're on a 12 months um, program where we help mentor them and they meet with lots of different practitioners which is brilliant and I think um, we sort of tend to keep in touch with those who might be new to the industry or offer advice if as and when they want it or yeah that's pretty much it for me. Um, I work with um, I'm a trustee of Open Door which is a charity that um, makes applying for drama school more accessible so we do a lot of mentoring um, through that organisation and we buddy um, uh, actors with, with students that are applying and auditioning for drama school. So the mentoring is really important um, with that organisation, yeah. Anyone else? Um, we haven't, I don't think we've formally mentored anyone, but there are definitely a number of kind of young, starting out actors, particularly those who kind of don't have the advantages of having, you know, the right connections or that, that we have, that we continue to support and help and just, you know, be there for them and try and help them along the way. Um, thank you. Um, so this is a question about processes. So you guys get the script. Um, so can you just talk a bit briefly about what happens afterwards in terms of kind of character breakdowns? Who does that? Um, you know, how you put together a list, you go to agents. How does that work? Shaheen, do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, so, yeah, so we're working on a script and we'll all, everybody in the office has to read it. So we all read it. We talk about it. Um, then somebody in the office will do a character breakdown. Um, we'll, we'll sort of work out uh, which characters to prioritise. So if there's kind of a couple of lead roles, those are the naturally the ones we'll, we'll sort of focus on first. Um, then at some point, it depends if it's a film and you are being asked to attach an actor of a certain level to a film, but that's not something we would put out on a breakdown. We would do ideas, share those and discuss those ideas with the director and the producer and sometimes a financier. And then you'd sort of, you know, you, you, 
work it to a sort of short list um, and make offers if it's if you're not having to sort of uh, have to sort of make straight offers then you would you know we'd talk about ideas we would do some castings we would shortlist people we would do chemistry tests um, so it, it all depends on the nature of uh, the project and the kind of level of talent that you're looking for but we always start with collectively reading the script doing the character breakdown discussing what roles um, we're going to focus on first and you know and if there's any roles that require that will need sort of extra research so if there's young people um, you know we're casting from a specific part of the country whether we need help outside of the office or one of us has got to go to the other end of the country to do some research those are all sort of things we'll discuss at the beginning of the journey Ooh. um has anyone else got anything else to add we've got to wrap up now so um oh, is there anything <laughs> okay <laughs> well guys that's it we did it thank you for taking the the lead for me when i got out um <laughs> thank you all so much um and again congratulations on your nominations um, and thank you for to our supporting partner for the sessions, TCL. Um, to the audience watching, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Um, sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, the we can. I'm just reading this now. Um, so you can join the conversation on BAFTA social channels. So keep having those conversations and ask those questions and stay tuned for details on where to watch both British Academy Television Craft Awards and Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards. Um, the next TV session is on the craft of editing, comedy and drama, um, which is later today at 5 p.m. And you can also join via Zoom. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B